good to be here today, and I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke 23, Luke the 23rd chapter. Tom, thank you for leading us. That's excellent. Appreciate the heart, man. I have known people out of the life of this church for about 48 years, and remarkable, I think of the Charlie and Mary Becketts that came out of these pews. I think of the Rick Shryox, who is soon to become the editor of the Christian Standard, maybe the most read publication in the Restoration Movement, is being led in the next generation from a brother out of the life of this church family. I think of those who have gone from here to serve, to make a difference. Only in heaven will you see the full reach of what God is doing through First Church at Barberton. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the imagination of your hearts. Someone said anybody can count the seeds in an apple. It's on the screen here. That's a simple task. You can count those seeds. But only God can count the apples in a seed. In every seed, there's the potential for a harvest. I mean, orchards, truckloads, trainloads of apples can come from a handful of seeds. Barberton Church is a seed-sowing church. Faithful in season and out of season. Steadfast, caring, loving, giving, missionaries, raising up students, People who've left the life of this church to go and serve in various places are touching eternity today. It was after World War II when some friends of ours, on the screen here on the far left is a fellow by the name of John Pemberton. John Pemberton was in a pilot, uh, in a, a paratrooper going into Normandy on uh, D-Day. And they were going into Normandy on the advance, and they overshot in a storm. They overshot their goal. They went behind enemy lines, crash landed. Most of the guys that started that day did not finish it. He crawled out of that plane with a couple of others, instantly became prisoners of war. He's in a POW camp in Germany praying for his life. Halfway around the world is Dennis Pruitt, the fellow there on your right. Denny Pruitt is in the Japanese. He's there in the trenches praying a similar prayer. God, get me home, and I'll serve wherever you want me to go. They ended up at Kentucky Christian, where Russ Schreiner and I and, and Charlie Beckett and others would be. We would hear these guys come and preach. They came back from the mission field. Their children were in school with us. I mean, I remember my door being knocked upon late at night. There would be John Mark Pemberton, his son, he would show me his notes from class that looked like chicken scratch. And he said, I know you've got tight notes. Let's study together. I've got to pass this test. And we would study for 30 minutes. And he'd talk about Africa for 40 minutes. It was a remarkable. They were saying, Russell, you've got to come to Africa to see what God is doing. I promised for years. Now, John Mark Pemberton, his son, would die early death at 53. I still had not made my way to Zimbabwe. They still were saying, Russell, you've got to come. I remember one time when John Mark would call from Zimbabwe, he'd say, Russell, I've got an airplane. We can go from church to school to church to school. And, and I said, John Mark, I, I won't get in a car with you. Why would I get in an airplane with you? <laughs> I just got back from there a few days ago. They're still talking about the times that John Mark would be up in the air and would run out of gas and glide his way to a street or a field or somewhere and put the plane down. Now, I want to say, you talked about live by faith. He lived by extra capital letters faith. After World War II, they planted seeds. They planted churches and schools. 67 years later, there's 20,000 kids a day on 29 campuses. I just returned from there a few days ago. This time last week, I was just landing I made my way to about half of those schools, preaching morning, noon, and night to six to 800 to 1,200 high school kids at a time. We met for three days with preachers and leaders, uh, day and night for three days, 12 sessions. I spoke at six of those. 
It was a remarkable, the, the hungry hearts of the folks in Africa are ready to launch a movement across Central Africa. They said, for 67 years, churches in America have planted into us, prayed for us. We now have 67 years, over a half a million students who've gone through our schools. 20,000 today are in the schools on 29 campuses. And the remarkable thing is they're not just thinking about Zimbabwe. They're thinking about Mozambique and Uganda and Zambia. I got a call from Lexington, Kentucky. Charlie Delaney said, Russell, we took about a hundred and some of your leaders and we took them over into Zambia and we started planting churches where they speak Shona. He said, one of the young men, Jeffrey, was exceptionally bright. We sent him to England, to Oxford. He got his law degree. He came back practicing law. He runs for parliament, has a seat in parliament, and now is on track to become the speaker of the house for the nation of Zambia. And he came out of one of your schools. We have a 200-bed hospital. Two smaller events that are 100-bed clinics. We, we have now seen the opportunity to launch from Zimbabwe a movement that will impact a generation through Central Africa. I was training and working with these folks right here. And, and they rearranged the calendar. They're hungry. They travel for hours. They said, we know we have five sessions planned for today. But if we rearrange lunch a little bit, could we get three sessions before lunch? I said, absolutely. They come early and they stay late. They take notes. They want to share the life, the love, the hope that's in Christ. They are not easily distracted. Three-fourths of them don't have electricity. Three-fourths of them don't have a television. Three-fourths of them don't have running water. They're very focused. This one thing. They think that we have become an America obsessed with the trivial. That there's an addiction to fantasy and we've missed fact. We have too many options and not enough character to prioritize what's most important. They said, at least we don't have anything. We live on a dollar a day. Only about 10% of them have cars. 10 to 15% of them have bicycles. A few more have uh, motorcycles. Most of them walk. Walk everywhere they go. Most of them live within 50 to 60 miles, uh, 90% of their life within a 50-mile radius. They don't know anything about Hollywood. They don't know anything about what's going on. And, and every now and then they get a drift about what's going on in woke America. And one of the young men listed up and said, Hey, I saw something on international news about this woke stuff going on in America. We better train hard because some of us are going to have to come back to America to be missionaries to you folks. I said, Pray well, that might be. I believe we have a generational impact that's in the making. We're at a critical crossroads. I want to thank this church for praying for us. I want to thank this church for encouraging us. Only through you folks providing tools to win do we have 20,000 kids a day on Christian schools. Look at the next slide. I want to share this with you. You see those blazers? Notice those kids don't have anything to their name except their uniform. Those boys know how to tie a Windsor knot. They wear those blazers when it's 85 degrees because that means they're making good grades. 85 degrees, they'll show up in blazers. Last week, I was teaching in a 750 kids under a tin roof. It was 102 outside, and I finally looked over to the principal and said, can I take off my jacket? He said, yes. In fact, the students may also remove their blazers, and they applauded. Now, let me say this. They are hungry for God, hungry to make a difference, and ready to become a generational impact that we believe if we plant life-giving churches throughout Central Africa, we could keep Islam from sweeping a continent. Islam is coming from the North Pell-Mell with oil money, and they're building, they're building mosques everywhere they can coming south. They're coming into places like Ethiopia and being stopped by the Coptics and the Orthodox. They're being stopped in places like Uganda that used to be Idi Amin's territory. Those mosques are empty. Churches are filling. We believe through Central Africa we can absolutely plant hundreds of life-giving churches that could keep Islam from sweeping a continent. Islam is right now in the middle of a jihad from Northern Africa trying to go through South. And they're being stopped at key places. 
I believe you need to continue praying for the warfare because just north of us in Uganda, the Islamists came out of the Congo, 20 some of them, came into a Christian school and hacked 47 kids to death with machete. It was never, it was one time in the, in the international press and then they went silent because it doesn't fit their narrative or what they're trying to portray. My son this morning is in the middle of Burma and Thailand. He said, Dad, in two weeks we had over 200 field transfusions because the communists are slaughtering Christians in northern Burma and the news is saying nothing about it. He said we had over 200 field transfusions. He works with the Free Burma Rangers. There is warfare for the future of our globe and the critical crossroads of right and wrong, good and evil are weighing in the balances right now. Do not allow the media, do not allow those folks to seduce you into the sleep that things are okay on foreign soil. I want to tell you something. There is a warfare and they're facing it. Christians are paying a high price in northern Burma along the Chinese border. The Chin and Kachin, the, the Karin, that my grandfather worked with a hundred years ago, the Morrises. Rick Shryock from this church studied about my grandparents for a semester. What if I told you hundreds of thousands of Christians are right now in jeopardy in northern Burma? I think in the middle of Africa. These young people, these young guys right here, they know what's going on. They know what Islam does to little girls. They know what Islam, the kind of trauma that they bring. When you bring Sharia law, you bring captivity and slavery and darkness. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And they're getting ready. They're going to stand. They're going to shine. And they're going to make a difference. And I want to thank you for praying for them. We had over 2,000 people baptized in the last couple of years. Notice this next one. It was 940 some in 2022 and another 1,200 since. Last two years, over 2,000 baptisms. See this next slide with me, if you would. Hit that next slide one time there. If you could hit the next slide, please. This is a campus called Living Proof. 150 acres. About half of it's done. We are gleaming the 27 campuses, the 28. We're gleaming those to bring the best, most likely to succeed as preachers, teachers, and leaders. We're going to bring them to one place to live. We're going to start a, a West Point Christian high school, so to speak. Intense, passionate. The, the coaches and, and the teachers and the ministers will live on campus with them. And the bottom line is preparing them for a life of Christ-honoring service. I want you to pray for Living Proof High School, Living Proof Christian Academy. It's about halfway done. And I want to thank you all for praying for it to happen. In the next few days, more people will be talking about the cross of Christ than any other dates on the calendar. Christ's passion on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection will be discussed in offices and from neighbors, on phones and on the internet. During the next few days, more people will be recognizing the life, death, and miraculous resurrection than any other week of the entire year. Most folks don't realize that the book of Matthew, the gospel of count of Matthew, the word Matthew means gift of God. It is a book written about the life of Jesus primarily to the Jews. More Bible prophecy quoted in the book of Matthew than any other book in the New Testament. You've got the book of Mark. It's short. It's written to the Romans. They wanted it short and sweet. Had a specific audience. Luke was a historical a historian and a doctor. Details. John wrote to the Greek culture because 300 years before Christ, Alexander the Great was conquering the known world and building Greek-speaking cities all over the Mediterranean. And to this day, there's still Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria cities all over. They were Greek-speaking citadels so that by the time you come to Christ, the trade language of the world was Greek. The New Testament was written into the common, the Koine Greek. Note something. John wrote primarily to that culture. But the last seven days of Christ's earthly ministry, out of 33 years of his life, the seven days take up about 30% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
I was an adult in the ministry for 10 years before I realized that. that. Of the 89 chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 30 of those chapters deal with seven days. Sunday, known as Palm Sunday, we see the scripture, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus is hailed by the people as Messiah. On Monday, he's cleansing the temple. On Tuesday, he's leading a controversy. The Jews are wanting to argue about whether or not he should heal on the Sabbath. You know, they love their rules more than they love people, and that's a problem. They love their position. They walked around in their, their religious robes, and they held their head high, self-righteous, and they walked by people that Jesus cared for and loved. The people who hated Jesus the worst were not the Romans. It was the religious leaders of those days who shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. The religious leaders stapled Jesus to a Roman cross. It wasn't the drunks and the pagans and the prostitutes. It wasn't the folks from Planned Parenthood that put him. I'm telling you, it was the people who called themselves religious leaders were his worst enemies. Wednesday is his day of rest. He washes feet on Wednesday. Thursday is the Last Supper, preparation for Passover. He would become our Passover lamb. The longest day of his earthly ministry, known as Good Friday. I mean, it's not so good for him, but it's eternally good for us. Trials in the Sanhedrin, Herod, Pilate, there he's rejected, there he's lied about, there he is gossiped and rumored about and crucified on Friday and buried. Saturday, his body rests in the tomb. But the first Peter says that his spirit, soul, and consciousness are proclaiming victory to the saints in paradise. While Jesus' body was in the tomb, his spirit, soul, he said, it is finished. He paid it in full. Telastai, an accounting term, paid in full. It is finished. Draw the bottom line. He is in paradise, his conscience, his spirit, his body. Abraham, he says, your sins have been paid for in full. David, your murdering guilt and adultery I've paid for in full. He would, on the cross, he was declaring where he was going, this day you'll be with me in paradise, he said to the one thief. To all the saints that died under the Old Testament, Jesus was proclaiming victory and freedom for eternity. On Sunday, he raised from the dead to give us a picture portrait of our resurrection life. Jesus ate with his disciples. Russ, Shriner, you and I have enjoyed a few meals together. We're going to get to eat in heaven and not worry about the calories. If you think God can make good food here, who gave us corn and corn on the cob with butter and a little salt? That, that's not half bad, is it? He says in Genesis 9, I give you these things that are moving, the deer of the field and all the stuff out there, they shall be meat for you. I enjoy a little steak now and then. I enjoy a little chicken now and then. When I was over in Africa, we, we had chicken morning, noon, and night. That was their favorite. Our, our, our whole team, I said, all right, guess, what are we going to have for lunch? Chicken. <laughs> it was chicken in the pot or chicken out of the pot. Sometimes you open the pot, you see the whole chicken. There's the beak staring at you. I always went for the far side of the beak. I went towards limbs and wings and whatever I could get elsewise. Let me say this. God gave us the opportunity to eat here. He created taste. We haven't seen nothing yet. There's a party going on around here, a celebration that lasts throughout the years. We're going to celebrate in heaven. There is a party that we're going to celebrate and rejoice. I mean, it's not going to be slow singing and sad walking. I used to think, man, what's going to go in heaven? Everybody's going to get bored. No way. It's going to be life everlasting, overflowing life. He raised from the dead to give us a picture portrait of our... Uh, Jesus could be touched. He could be hugged. I think of the three Calvary, the three crosses of Calvary, more than just landscape. Three crosses on Calvary mean something that is eternal. We come to Calvary where a Savior died and salvation was born. Max Lucado says, we come to Calvary where God prayed and a mob cursed. This morning we come to Calvary and a deep darkness that enveloped the earth and the hearts of men might be filled with a divine light. Today we come to the Mount of Calvary where Christ was rejected of men so we might be accepted of God. We come to Calvary where the proud Jews stumbled and the arrogant Greeks scoffed. We come to Calvary where the power of God is displayed in a wounded warrior. 
This morning we come to Calvary where the wisdom of a holy God exposed the delusions of wicked men. We come to Calvary where every one of us must come if we wish to be forgiven and saved. The way of the cross leads home. Say that with me. The way of the cross leads home. Let's try that again. The way of the cross leads home. The cross is symbolic of the communion of heaven and a communication of love and a community of servants. We are never more like Jesus than when we're living the cross that starts with the communion of heaven that helps me to love the unlovely and forgive the unforgivable. The communication of love and a community of servants. Note something. In chapter 23 of Luke's gospel, Jesus is in the final moments. On either side of him are a pair of thieves. The contrast of the two of them, look in verse 32. In chapter 24, verse 32, where it says, I'll make sure I'm in the right chapter. I just moved over here. One more piece here. My Bible was stolen by Delta Airlines in a baggage. It's yet to be retrieved, so I borrowed one this morning that is a little unfamiliar, but let me get there. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. And that, so they divided up his clothes by casting lots. One well, of the most obscene portraits in all of history is the Holy Son of God who had done no evil, fed the hungry, cared for the sick, and they're laughing and scoffing about his death and gambling for his clothes at the foot of the cross. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There is a written notice above him which read, This is king of the Jews. We don't know the names of those guys. But I'm telling you, those fo folks that followed the cross 2,000 years later, billions of people still know Peter, James, and John and those who followed the cross. There's a written notice above him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you are justly getting what we deserve? But this man has done no wrong. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Maybe he'd been at a sermon. Maybe he'd been at the feeding of the 5,000. He knew something about Jesus, had done no wrong, and he was getting ready to come into his kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Now let me say this. They are there in the, at the crossroads of history. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this event. 2,000 years later, there's still spiritual warfare over that property that's in the heart of Jerusalem. 2,000 years later, there's spiritual warfare that the eyes of the world are watching of what's going on in the streets of Israel. Now, some versions read Golgotha. That means the place of the skull. There they crucified him along with the criminals. Jesus would say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Notice, we are never more like Jesus than when we're giving and forgiving. Note this morning, we'll never grow in our walk with Christ until we learn to become a forgiving people. Husbands forgiving wives. Wives forgiving husbands. People in the pew forgiving each other. I want to say that there are folks in the life of the church who've been walking around with a grudge that has buried their joy, has absolutely brought a malignancy to their walk. And today, if you'd say, I want to be like Jesus to forgive and, and honor and give grace, I want a fresh touch, a fresh breath of heaven. One of the criminals hung there. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself. He's self-absorbed. Don't you fear God? The other one said. This man's done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me. Jesus says, today I tell you the truth. The first, I want you to take just three brief notes. One, that first thief that was rebellious... He is on the cross of rebellion, dying in his sins to a hopeless end. 
All of us are going to be on one of two sides of the cross. All of us will live and die on one of two sides of Christ. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. Now, I know there's a lot of folks that think that I'm going to be a part of spiritual Switzerland and I'll glide by in the, in the middle of it. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. There's never a time in the Bible where it says there's a great spiritual Switzerland in the middle that's going to be rescued. It says, those who are with Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Jesus. God's word is still true. Why did he go to the cross? He knew we needed a lifeline. This man on the cross of rebellion is dying a hopeless end. And I believe that there's people around us that we need to pray for that are standing where we used to be. Self-absorbed lives. Romans 3 says, All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, that we are enemies of the cross at that point. Romans 5 says, God demonstrated his love while we were still sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. There's a culture around us that's living in denial and delusion that leads to despair. Denial of where they came from. Denial of where they're going to. And the days in between get all confused. Denial, delusion, despair. Ernest Hemingway was considered to be one of the great patriarchs of American journalism. He was uh, read, very few people will graduate from high school in Barberton without reading one short story by Ernest Hemingway. You drive down through the keys, he's heralded as a patriarch. The bottom line is, Ernest Hemingway fathered children on four continents that he didn't take time to raise. At the height of his career, he was saying, I've heard about this Jesus and I've just seen too many Christians. And just like that, he thought he could wash his hands of Christ. Denial, delusion, despair. He goes into this farmhouse, puts his mouth over a shotgun, and blows himself into eternity. The patriarch of American journalism for his years. His suicide note was, the farce is over. Ernest Hemingway's suicide note, the farce is over. Life without God is a joke. It is despair. These people have gone through life. They've gone through the motions of an existence. They've mowed the lawn. They've gone to the t-ball games. They bowled. They put a little bit away for savings. They drew the social security. They painted the house. They took care of stuff. And then they planted their body. And what? If they draw the bottom line to your life, what's going to follow you into eternity is what matters. The people you prayed for, the missionaries you encouraged, the neighbor you witnessed to. On every side a voice I hear, the angels call from ear to ear, a voice I dare not lightly treat. Prepare, prepare thy God to meet. I've never been with anybody that ever said, Russell, could you, I know I'm in my last moments, but could you check the stock market to see how my IBM stock's doing? Can you, can you check to see how crops are? Russ Schreiner and I had a friend that we knew. He had one of the largest spreads in, Fair, in, in Fleming County, Kentucky. And as he was dying, his tenants were leaving the room, telling him the price of crops, encouraging him. He looked over at me and Porty said, I, I don't worry about the crops. I'm never going to raise another one. What mattered is his relationship to Jesus and people going to heaven with him. And every single thing else is dust. This man right here, he is in self-absorbed. He's hurling insults at Christ who could rescue him. Uh, I believe the French atheist Voltaire. He was Oprah Winfrey of his day. Voltaire said, my writings will someday be bolder and more read than the Bible. In a moment of pride, he said, My single handwriting shall destroy the edifices it took the twelve apostles a century to raise up. How many of you have read Voltaire lately? Anybody read Voltaire? How many of you read the Bible in the last month? People still reading their Bible. Notice something. Voltaire was so puffed up. You go to France today, you go from city to city, every other town has got a statue to Voltaire. The French atheist. Bottom line is, in his last breath, I've been abandoned by God and man. Shortly after his death, the house 
where he had declared that he was smarter and better and going to be more renowned than God, than Jesus. They bought his house. The Geneva Bible Society today prints from his press Bibles and the printing press that the American Bible Society has the house and the Geneva Bible Society has his press and his house is a place that they distribute Bibles from. God's got a sense of humor. It's like the atheistic farmer. He, he taunted and made fun of people who believed in the Lord. He wrote in, in a letter to the editor of the local newspaper. He was a really good farmer. He'd done well. He said, I plowed on Sunday. I planted on Sunday. I cultivated on Sunday. I hauled my crops in on bushels per acre than anyone else, even those who are supposed to be God-fearing, and I never made a single service to church. The editor printed the man's letter and then added his own remarks at the end. Editor's notes. Please note. God doesn't always settle his accounts in October. I think a lot of folks are going through life like a bundle of flesh and bones making their way from the cradle to the grave. They're not adding years to their life. Just adding days and months and then they're going to put a draw, a little line in between at the cemetery. It'll say the day they were born, the day they die, and that dash will mean very little unless they've given their life to Christ and helped others to get ready for heaven. The life of this church will matter a hundred years from now. I, I, I'm, I come from Kentucky and, and we, we think basketball is the deal. I mean, until this last week, we thought it was a real deal. My high school basketball coach and I married sisters. I mean, my high school basketball coach, he shared keys with me when I was 14. I had keys to the gym all the way through high school. We were buddies. We hung out. We still, for 45 years, we've been on the phone together following UK basketball, grieving from, I'll be in a hotel someplace a thousand miles away, I'm talking to Mike, and we're watching the same game on national TV. Now today, I want you to note, after Kentucky loses, the flags are at half-mast in Kentucky. Zoloft sales have escalated. Antidepressants being sold by the bushel. Suicide hotlines are ringing all over the state because we lost a basketball game. Yeah. What happened when Ohio State lost to Michigan? It was a bad day, wasn't it? Uh-huh, you remember that? I mean, in, in a year or two from now, we won't even remember. People's entire careers were adjusted by a few points on the scoreboard. Whole lives, families were adjusted and rearranged because, I mean, we're, we're into it. I want to say this, enjoy football, enjoy basketball, but I hope the day comes we get as passionate about the mission of Christ in the life of the church as any Ohio State football fan is at the, at, at the horseshoe. I hope we get as passionate about the life of Jesus and the mission of Christ as any UK basketball fan. I lived in Lexington, and I'm telling you, they packed up. They shut down. We had snow and sleet and ice, and they shut down the malls. They shut down churches. Everything was shut down. You couldn't move. It was just locked down ice. And they came on and said, well, but the opposing team had already gotten into town, and they can walk to the gym, and so they're going to go ahead and play the game. 23,000 people filled the stadium from rafter to rafter. They don't call in, they crawl in when it comes time for a ball game. What's going to happen when we get as passionate about the life of Christ as we do our jobs? Some of you worked hard in your jobs. You showed up on time. You worked hard. You did your work. You accomplished your mission. And when you left, they replaced you within days. Somebody else is sitting in your chair. Somebody else is using your typewriter. Somebody else is using your computer. What's going to matter? Your relationship to Jesus and those people going to heaven with you and everything else is dust in the wind. This man was consumed, but the man on the other side was, said, why are you all yelling at Jesus, he did no wrong. We're getting our just. He's on the cross of repentance, dying to his sin, to an endless hope. This day you'll be with me in paradise. I don't know that guy's name, but I love that epitaph. <laughs> this day you'll be with me in paradise. 
The cross of rebellion, a man dying in his sin to a hopeless end. On the other side of Christ is a man dying to his sin to an endless hope. The only hope we have is not the American Medical Association. Do well. I hope and pray the economy improves. Our, I hope and pray you work well and save hard. And Bottom line is, none of that is going to rescue you. Our only hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. In the middle of Africa, the people don't think the government can save them. Do you know what a Zim dollar is to one dollar? They're about 900 Zim dollars to one dollar American. I mean, you can have a stack of hundred dollar Zims that equal like two dollars to us. It is sad. These people know that they can't be rescued by this world and they are hungering for the God of heaven who will give them resurrection hope. This morning, Jesus is in the middle on the cross dying for our sins on the cross of redemption. Donald Barnhouse wrote this word. My sin and selfish rebellion make it clear that I deserved hell. On the cross, Jesus took my hell. Because I have accepted his amazing grace and received his pardon, there's nothing left for me but his heaven. You see, at the foot of the cross, I seek forgiveness. In the shadow of the cross, I dedicate myself to serve. In the glory of the cross, I shall rise to live eternally. When we leave this world, we're going to be on one of two sides of the cross. The cross of rebellion or the cross of repentance. Because in the center is the cross of redemption, Christ dying for our sins. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could have never paid. The message of that hope of the cross has resonated from these ch this church for decades. For decades, I've crossed paths with some of your Timothys, the Charlie Becketts, the Russ Shriners, guys like Rick Shryock, people around the world that are touching people for Christ because you took time to pray, equip, and train. There are future Rick Shryocks and Russ Shriners and Charlie Becketts that are being raised in this place. From this place can come a harvest of changed lives for this community. You've been given a wonderful plant. This is a neat build. There's a lot going, could go on right here. You're in a neat community. I'm telling you, there are people on every block that need Christ. I started something in my neighborhood called Pray and Walk, Meet and Greet, Stand and Shine. And the agnostics across the street, Jeff and Treva, came to my doorstep one day. Un, they said, uh, we don't believe your book, but we just got back from the doctor. And we, when you think about us, uh, Jeff has a tumor between his heart and his lungs. It's inoperable. I said, come in here, Jeff. We're not going to just talk. We won't pray with you, sir. In the weeks to come, his questions about life and the Bible, he, had, he, he was humbled. He gave his life to Jesus. Treva gave her heart to Christ. In his last 18 months, he was sharing hope. He discovered the Christ of hope. He discovered the communion of heaven. And I want to tell you, if you have captured the communion of heaven, it'll change the way you talk. It'll change the way you serve. What has been rearranged by Christ in your life in the last month? Your checkbook and your calendar will tell you that, about that. And everything else is nice talk. Christians are great about nice talk. Wonderful chit-chat. Love to put the cross on the bumper. Love to celebrate when we hear a good song. But what has changed in your calendar and your checkbook in the last month because your allegiance to Jesus has made a difference in your priorities? I want you to bow your head with me for just a moment. And maybe there's someone here who's been on the cross of rebellion, sneering, resistant to God, holding God at arm's reach, not really giving them a fair chance. But maybe today you'd say, God, I need your help. I have sinned. And I need amazing grace. I need a burial and resurrection in my life. A, a baptism of a tomb and a womb to birth a new chapter. Maybe you're here and you'd say, God, I, 
I need a fresh chapter. I've been baptized years ago. I take communion every week. But I need for Christ to make a difference in my walk, my witness, my service, my sacrifice, my affection, my prayer life needs to change. God, break the rote routine of religious. And I pray, God, you would take us from that religiousness to a relationship. Refresh the communion of heaven here, God. I thank you for the life of this church, for those who serve and care and give regularly. And I pray, God, the ranks of the faithful will grow. Bring new families into this fellowship. Bring new children into this. I pray, God, that the the young people will grow and that this church will become a vibrant, fruit-bearing place. Thank you for their preacher. Thank you for Brother David. And thank you for his family and their work of faith and the leaders around them. Now I pray that you'd encourage their step in missions and wherever. I thank you, God, that only in heaven will Barberton Church realize all that you've accomplished through them. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.